If you can give us just a, an overview of, of you know, how, how the morning and afternoon went and, and your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, we started um, by asking the experts in our group um, to just to give some clarity for the rest of the participants um, around COPD, the actual um, disease process and the use of um, non-invasive ventilation. So I think that was really, really helpful to start the discussions off. Um, what we did identify in terms of um, practices and the models of care across the region in, in, in different organisations was it was very variable, there's lots of variation there. Um, then we started looking at um, how patients actually, from the point where patients present in the a &E department, um, and worked through what um, the key interventions would be from um, triage and the types of um, investigations that needed to happen, who would do those, um, and really identifying what people saw as the key barriers to, to those interventions. Um, and then we um, went on to look at the barriers in more detail and have some more discussions around them and looked at those within the theoretical domains framework. Um, and then finally moved on to um, actually using the matrix to um, identify how we could get behavioural change around the, you know, those key barriers. Um, we focused on knowledge and we focused on skills particularly. Um, and I think that we just really started to get a flavour and it gave people a flavour of how, of how the model could be used. Great. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that from our group. <laughs> <laughs> And did you come up with any specific um, strategies or behavior change techniques to address the knowledge and skills? Did you get that far? It was more of a, a, a taster that. session, right? Good. Any other, no other thoughts from the COPD group? Great. What about for the end of life care? Um, Jerry or Stephen, do you have any thoughts in terms of summarizing our approach to the the session, which I think is slightly different, but I think got to roughly the same point in the end. Yeah, I think the feedback would be very similar to the, the first group and uh, chip in the two tables uh, who looked at end-of-life care as I go along, if I'm not quite capturing the issues. But um, certainly we we looked at identifying the problem around uh, end-of-life care and one of the key areas we thought worthy of further consideration was the identification of people approaching end-of-life care and how we could improve that. And that does coincide, not surprisingly, I suppose, with uh, quality statement one from the NICE quality standard for end-of-life care. Um, so we identified who was involved in, in um, conveying those messages uh, and talking to families and patients around end-of-life care. Uh, and out of that whole range of people, because it got massive, I think, in the end, didn't it? There's lots of people potentially involved. We distilled that down into uh, three priority groups, the, the GP primary care element, the patient element, and the carer uh, family uh, aspect to, to communicating those messages uh, for people who've been identified at end-of-life care. Some of the barriers were then looked at uh, and the behaviours that we'd like to change and uh, some, of the, some of the issues or barriers that we identified were around a social taboo around talking about death, fear of negative reaction from the family uh, and the patient. Uh, issues around capacity, time, opportunity to have uh, proper conversations, lack of awareness of cultural differences uh, around uh, the, the, the cultural issues around end of life care, the different cultural issues, and having uh, explored those particular issues, barriers, we then looked at some of the interventional techniques from, from the framework, from the matrix. So some of those, uh, we looked at most of the uh, domains, 
but uh, for, certainly for this table, so it might be a bit table six, six centric, where skills around looking at modelling for GPs, around how to conduct such a conversation, uh, possibly using expert input from people uh, with particular expertise in end of life care or peers, where it's a clinical area of interest. Uh, we looked at it being incorporated into G core GP practice training um, and how experts within within the field might continue to offer support uh, in that particular area. We looked at emotions as another domain or another area. So we looked again at professional support to discuss issues. We looked at the multidisciplinary team in primary care as an environment to share emotions. We talked about the fear or, uh, of consequences of having the conversation, fear of litigation, fear of patient family reaction. And some of the interventions might be about selecting the right time in, in the day, finding the opportunity, finding the time, having the right people present when the conversation takes place, um, and a, an issue of around how, how, how you might manage your, your day and your time available. Great. Any Do you want to add anything to that, Jerry? That was pretty comprehensive, Steve. <laughs> I don't think an idea that. I think I'll hand over to this table, because they may have. Any other general views from the end of life care group. I think having, having been part of that, um, that particular group, what was fascinating to me, and sorry if I'm sounding like a broken record to, to that group, but I think the, 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 the emotion conversation I think was really fascinating to me because it tends to be something that is, in my experience, overlooked when looking at trying to change or help clinicians provide better care, but in, particularly in that context, I think, and probably in COPD as well, that. Um, it's, it's, it, there, there, there's an inherent emotional aspect to providing care in those contexts that may well need to be considered when designing um, um, strategies or interventions to help clinicians provide better, um, to, or have better discussions with their patients. Um, so I think it was just interesting to, uh, I was interested to, to observe how much um, emphasis everyone was putting on to that aspect, which tends to be, as I say, overlooked in most other contexts. Um, does anyone have any general, sorry, any, did anyone raise their hand around any other inputs from the end of life group? Okay. Any other general thoughts about just using this process to um, just structure looking at um, some of the barriers and, and thinking about some of the solutions to those barriers? How did you find the, the approach? Did you find it useful, not so useful? Um, any, any general thoughts about having a structured way of looking at this? Did it allow you to think through things that you might not have otherwise thought? Or was it consistent with what you're already doing? Just for the sake of the group, it would be yeah, just interesting to get people's thoughts on that. I think it's um, because you're doing it in a systematic way and because the people that you work with are very diverse, it actually gives you the opportunity to find something that will suit everyone. Hmm. And you know, we had quite a lot of discussion in our group about how you present different information to doctors or to nurses, say. And if you get that wrong, then people are just gonna stop listening to you. But looking through all the 14 different areas that you're considering the barriers for, actually you can personalize it even more mm. if you know your team. So in actual fact, it should speed up the way you then deliver it because you'll be able to say, actually, I know this person is like this. This will help them. Mm. But actually, this other person's like this and this will help them. And actually, you've considered all those things first of all. So you're not going in with a plan to change something and then thinking, oh, actually, this person's not going to listen to me. I wish I'd thought of that before because you've already considered it. And so it actually is a really helpful structure from that point of view. And then, of course, there's all the other things that come on which then support your implementation of it. Great. But you have to know your team, I think. So. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I think our tables were much of the opinion that we would have benefited more from the brainstorming part of the day that we'd had uh, in before lunch, for after lunch as well, to do some of the barrier, to work out what the barriers were, because we had a whole remit of different things, and we thought if we'd had that big brainstorming, we could then have probably pulled them into the individual 
domains to look at. But then after that, I think it was very good for working out the enablers. We weren't perhaps so convinced about the table at the back about what to choose for skills and things. But obviously, you know, I think we wondered whether or not that would change if you had a different set of, say, clinicians sitting around the room, what they would actually say, or we would benefit from doing X, Y, and Z. We were interested role playing didn't appear in one of the things we thought actually would have appeared in. So. Mm. Just an observation. Um, I thought the, the um, potential behaviour change techniques are quite useful as a menu of options. I'm not quite sure that, uh, well, I, and I don't know about other people in the group, quite agreed with all of the shading options because there seem to be an awful lot of those boxes agreed non use, which I think there's a danger that they get then kicked out of the, kicked out of touch. I mean, one of them was things like time management. Well, actually, we were talking about the importance of having good time management in order to make space to deliver news to families about end of, and discuss end of life care. And similarly, um, things like cognitive restructuring. And I would say around the um, things like environmental context and resources, uh, yeah, I think cognitive restructuring is quite important because people quite often use that as a barrier. Oh, we can't do this because we're going, it's terrible cutbacks. We've got no resources. And actually, sometimes this, we just have to do this. We just have to make this happen mm -hmm. so I actually I think it is helpful I would just question this being used too prescriptively exactly. um, and only the white boxes get used because I think it's ruling out a lot of potential but actually having them listed a whole range of techniques is really good Go for it. Well, I mean, one thing that um, so Susan Meeky would say this is the worst science she's ever done and she's a very very serious scientist so this was really a proof of principle where she had five people coming together and sort of saying, can we start to develop a consensus around this? Um, I think the value of it, it is starting to sort of say, well, here's things we think, you know, that a group of very thoughtful people think is potentially useful, um, but it's, it's a judgment. There is, um, just published in the last month electronically, an updated version of this, which I haven't looked at yet. So I don't know anything about it, but it takes the 93 behavior change tax, uh, techniques and the 14 behavior change domains. So I would see this as being, if you like, an example of what could be done. Yeah. We need to generate a much better evidence base around this um, to actually know uh, yeah, what will be useful. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, my guess is that, um, um, I think there's 33 or something here. You know, most of us would probably not have identified these things, so it, it, you know, I find it kind of quite mind expanding in terms of, um, oh yeah, I, could, I hadn't thought about that, or you know, hadn't thought about graded tasks within this idea about changing um, professionals' behaviours. So if Susan Meeke was here, she'd say you're absolutely right in terms of, yeah, this isn't um, tablets of stone, it's very much a work in progress. Okay, I mean, what we wanted to do in this final bit was kind of again, um, Kind of interested. I mean, what, this is now the second workshop that we've done uh, uh, around this, um, and you know, one of the ideas that Nikos about Nikos um, um, asking us to do this was that there's a perception that the kind of the the, the methods that are being approached here might be helpful for people in terms of the kind of quality of care work that they're doing in their trust or organisation, uh, and. It would, you've now kind of, most of you I think have been here for both workshops, good to get some sense of either, sounds very nice, good to come and spend a day in the life center, but actually has no practical value whatsoever um, in my organization. Or actually this looks like it might be useful, um, but we're aware that certainly at this point in time, um, you know, th there's probably not been enough sort of yeah, ex exposure to these ideas. This is kind of a taster, uh, and, and kind of what um, you know, what Nikos might do to try and sort of uh, um, you know, further develop that. So, I, I mean, I've got a few questions that I thought it'd be interesting to ask. I mean, I mean, one would be what normally happens when you're kind of faced with a quality problem in your trust. How similar or different is it to what we've done you know, today and the time before? And I'll pick on somebody. Yeah, go on. Oh, wait. Thank you. Uh, well, in my experience, we look at quality standards and you compare yourself, but I don't think what people do is, is actually look at these behaviours and how the techniques that are more likely to be successful in, in helping you change the behaviour and culture of, of what you're doing. So I think 
for, for me, it, it, they should do more of that than just saying it has to come in. Um, you all have to have the breeze training online, um, regardless of who you are, what you are. Um, and it actually doesn't achieve anything and nobody comes back to monitor any change. So you think, I'll just not bother. They'll not notice and that's what you do, well, perhaps. Okay, good. Other comments? Yeah, Mark. There's something, I've, I guess I'm getting a, more of a sense of the, the tools and techniques now and how they apply to practical problems. And they have parallels with other, perhaps more ad hoc or less all, all embracing ones. I guess there is, for these types of tools, there is always a, an issue about whether, how, what proportion of your sphere of influence you can get into type one versus type two thinking. That mm -hmm. do we do we move into type two, i.e., slow down, think about what's going on here, guys, rather than. Uh, the Martin Eccles, let's just do the first thing that comes off the top of our head or whatever, which is mm. type one thinking. And I, I guess I'm, uh, if there's an issue, it's, it's about um, can you get enough of a group of people in type two mode on any particular issue than actually what, what technique you, sets of techniques you would use them? It's actually persuading people have got to slow down a bit mm -hmm. and use a set of tools and techniques for exploring what the problem is and the range of possible solutions. I guess I'm, I'm more, more persuaded of the value of that than so which of the range of tools, and, I mean, mm. these ones that from Susan Mickey and others are great, but, but it's that slowing, slowing yep. down thing that I think is probably more, more of a deal for me in my, in my world. Yeah. And I, I think my op op observation is that people often jump to conclusions or to solutions. I often spend a lot of time saying, well, why do you think that would work? And as you start, and you know, that, you know, that, you know, the academic detail is going to get three minutes over this period of time. It's really good for social preparation and knowledge. You have very limited knowledge issue. It's not going to change skill. It's not going to change organizational procedures. So often when people go to a solution, I spend a lot of time saying, uh, yeah, are you sure that's going to work? And quite often you find that it starts to unravel. I think the value of this, it, it is a systematic process. I think what the, work, the idea about the behavioral approaches is you're starting to build upon extant bodies of knowledge and language that helps communication, although you need to know the language. So I think one of the things we were getting to in our group was there's times where the language wasn't as transparent because it was technical. Um, so you could be very, uh, you could use the kind of French model or the knowledge to action model without using any of this sort of ex existing theory and do it from a very much a sort of you know, personal viewpoint, I think that would still be better than jumping to a solution. But I think you know, what we should be doing is saying where there's external knowledge, whether it comes from behavioral sciences, organizational sciences, improvement sciences, we should also be trying to pull that in. Uh, and again, I think this sort of potentially helps a little bit. I'd kind of be interested in, I mean, Avril gave a really nice example of you know, basically uh, what was a really strong quality um, project in the hospital that hopefully the data will show that continues. Um, but my guess is in real, I mean, what you know, we talked about is slowing down, thinking about this more systematically. And I think at various times during the day, you've been talking about just the, the pressures within a kind of quality group in a hospital. I mean, what, do you want to say anything about that? Because I think at one level, we're trying to sort of suggest an approach which might be kind of quite hard in certainly sort of some of the constraints that um, Avril was talking about. Does that make sense? Do you want to say anything about that? Need a microphone? Catherine hasn't run for... I guess um, it's about the culture of the organisation, the philosophy that exists there and how committed... I feel our organisation is really committed to that improvement, so therefore it's invested time um, and resource into getting some of those governance frameworks there to actually enable some of this change. Um, but I do really identify with, you know, what it's like in the real world on the front line. And um, part of my role has been around um, 
monitoring um, our compliance with NICE guidance. And we talked earlier about, you know, the immense amount of guidance that's published and how do we understand, how do we take time to actually understand what the guidance is suggesting? Um, how do we measure ourselves against those standards in a really meaningful way? And actually that can take quite a lot of time. Um, and then around how do we support the services and facilitate that within an organisation so that people aren't out on their own um, struggling to actually make change. So for me, um, I think there's something about an investment in an organisation um, to actually facilitate and enable those changes through the systems that they have in place or some of the key roles within the organisation. I see my role as head of quality and safety as a very facilitative one that takes the bureaucracy out of a lot of the systems and really enables excellent patient care. And it's really employing some of think these these tools um, in a very pragmatic way mm. um, that I find people actually on the front line do value. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think where we're getting to, what I'm hoping is within the implementation science world, we're getting to the stage where we are developing pragmatic tools that will help people on the front line. Um, I think if you sort of look back probably five or ten years ago, it was even more arcane. Um, and you would never try and do what we were doing in a research world within a service setting world. But mm -hmm. some of these models now seem as though they're useful. And the hand hygiene model uh, example I gave last time was one where our hospital's in a huge amount of work on hand hygiene, and physician hand hygiene was just intransigent. intransigent. It couldn't do any, uh, get improvements. And that was where it's worthwhile investing in a much more rigorous process. So it could be there's also a mixed model where we do, you know, do some very pragmatic stuff see if we get improvement, but where we're not getting much improvement, that actually some of these things would also work through. My guess is if people were used to this, you know, these approaches, they'd still, they'd bring them into some of those rapid processes. You know, it's often people assume there's a knowledge gap, and often, you know, I find for a lot of things we're not doing well, it's not a knowledge issue. It's often more often things like skills or um, beliefs about consequences, and we're very bad at giving people opportunities to practice things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we assume that you know, GPs or nurses will can change their way in which they communicate with patients without actually practicing it when it's really hard. Okay, yeah? Can I ask, uh, to what extent do you think um, national audits uh, incentivizing payment schemes such as that for hip fracture care uh, bring about change more quickly than relying on the behavioural methodology on its own? Which, um, which is chicken and which is egg? So um, if you look at the evidence around financial incentives for healthcare professionals, uh, what you find is you get on average about a, you know, a, a six to seven percent improvement in the quality of, in, in performance, which is very similar to what you get in a lot of these other approaches. So I think often in the last decade, uh, financial reimbursement has been offered as being the, the panacea. This will solve the problems. If you look at the evidence, um, it, it is it, certainly it can be one of the parts of the solution, but it's unlikely to be the, the major solution. We, we did the largest trial of financial incentives in the world, which was with community dentists in Scotland. Scotland with the FIFA service to get them to um, fit uh, uh, sealants in children from deprived areas, and we could demonstrate that we could get a seven percent improvement, which is great. The Scottish, I mean, the Scottish Health Service rolled it out overnight. You know, it was a really positive success, but it wasn't going from sort of you know or you know thirty percent to a hundred percent. It was again an incremental approach, and across most of the FIFA service stuff or financial reimbursement stuff, that's what you find. Globally, COF is seen as a big, is is almost the the, the poster child for um, pay for performance. Um, but people like Martin Rowland would say, well, COF built upon, in effect, 20 to 30 years of development in primary care. Um, that certainly if you compare it to Canada, we are, we are, we are literally 30 years behind um, you know, UK primary care. So uh, um, it has got a very strong economic theoretical basis. Um, but, you know, the, the empirical evidence is it is only one of the tools that we have. Um, and it becomes, I mean, there's lots of challenges for it. So we should certainly think about it, but think about it cautiously and not think it will be um, you know, the global panacea. 
don't know if yeah, we, we um, I think I explained to you earlier, Gary, um, we, we work with Advancing Quality, which some of you may know of in the Northwest, and they've been part of this. Uh, it started off as a H quid, and it's now C quid, and it was a payment, and now it's a punishment if you don't hit the targets and so on, and they've improved. But interestingly, the other thing that happens is once you start achieving sort of 95% adherence to measures, people actually start switching off because they say, well, we've done that. So please stop talking to us about getting people's stents within 90 minutes because we, we know how to do that. And in the recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine shows that about two years is the optimum for these things. And then once you've done that, actually you need to go and do something else. There's no point in keeping berating people about the same quality standards you've got to going to move on. Okay, so... Potentially what we're doing is offering a broader palette, a broader range of tools that might be helpful. Um, but I think one of the things, yeah, my, I mean, my sense in the kind of the COPD group is there are times where we are trying to sort of offer you things which, uh, or which if you're a psychologist, you think, oh yeah, okay, I understand that. But mo uh, you know, most of us, apart from probably Justin, are not psychologists. Uh, and so we kind of look at it and think, well, I think I know what a graded task is, but I'm not quite sure, and I'm not quite sure how to do that. I mean, one of the things I'd be interested in is that within your kind of quality groups in your organizations or trusts, do you have you know, people with skill sets that would actually be able to take this information and kind of be very comfortable with it? Or you know, is this something where you think there's a, a you know, if, if this is valuable, where there needs to be some sort of, um, you know, a, a, um, some sort of investment to sort of try and improve sort of a, a, um, people's awareness and skills to use this knowledge base? Oh, okay. Sorry, Karen, and then, no, well, it's okay, we've got two, so we've got two, Mike. Go on, Karen first. Me, Karen. Um, in Newcastle, we've got a facilitator who is um, employed um, doing our MSc and PhD in, in change techniques, so I was going to ask her, does she know, you know, has she come across th this tool? Um, so, the, so they are, we do have somebody who mm -hmm. is, is trying to work on change and development change techniques across the organisation. Without, without insulting any of the other GPs sitting in the room, if I tried to use that kind of terminology, mainly the stuff in the, in the sort of templates at the back, I'd lose them. Yeah. I, I can fully see sitting in a, in, a, in a timeout session going, I mean, I'm just thinking advanced care planning, it would be great to get them to sit there, for them to tell me what the barriers are to advanced care planning, for them to then sit there and say how, you know, how they would put enablers in, and then for them to tell me how we would then put that out as a behavioural change technique, but not using the terminology I think you've got in there, because, I mean, yeah. it's just gobbledygook to me. Um, we, as a CCG, didn't, would not have anybody who's skilled in that currently. Um, so. mm -hmm. Justin, do you want to say anything? Because, I mean, Justin's at the moment doing a large trial of uh, trying to improve diabetes care, which is built upon a very sophisticated model, but um, I, mean, I, mean, I don't think you say to the GPs, now we're going to get you to do an action coping plan. Maybe you do, I don't know. But uh, I mean, watch it, because I, I think there's a reality. I mean, it's also an issue about who should do this brainstorming, because often we're not very good at understanding what changes our behavior. Otherwise, I'd be a lot thinner, a lot fitter, and uh, would drink less. Um, yeah, so there is an issue about who should do that, but also just sort of how you present this to, you know, when you're engaging with particularly clinician audiences who, you know, suffer fools very badly. So yeah, I mean, the approach that we've taken is not to, to, to present the 93 or the 33 all at once. It's a sort of, well, graded task approach to slow, slow, slowly add a few BCTs. And, not, and I think the, having the, the language that we use in the taxonomy is one thing, but having another more useful language in everyday practice, we found. So we, rather than use a specific language that is in the taxonomy for some of the things that we're talking with, with GPs and nurses about, we adapted using you know, input from clinicians themselves about you know, how would you describe this in your own words so that it's rather than us force feeding a language that may not be useful, we're using what the way people already understand, which a lot of this stuff is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're describing things in a particular way so that we can have consistency, but there's no, if it's not helpful for a particular audience, then there's no reason to focus on that, that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the first time we kind of used a lot of this would be, um, uh, um, 
There's a yeah. Oh, you got it. Oh, let me. Okay, Sorry. I'll, I'll turn yeah. my bit then. But we did a, a trial to try and improve um, low back pain management by GPs in Australia, reduce X-rays, increase um, um, exercise, uh, and we ended up with an intervention that was delivered over two CPD sessions. But there were eight behaviour change techniques embedded into that. But the GPs who were participating probably wouldn't know about that, apart from that it's a bit more interesting. So instead of having sort of, you know, someone, well, you know, maybe me sort of looking at it, but instead of having someone talking at them for 45 minutes, they were doing, you know, role play, they were sort of doing some small group activity over here, you know, there was modeling, there was social influence, a whole range of other things around that. So, I mean, I, I often we go back to a sort of a, a knowledge base issue and we end up with sort of rather didactic. And I think one of the things with the behavior change techniques is often it actually gives you know, a range of approaches that might be more fun for the people involved in them. You know, to challenge them. Um, so, I was just going to add um, my experience, certainly, you know, from the modernisation agency and then lean in healthcare and so on, that the kind of service improvement world that was building within trusts and certainly good service improvement leaders could do this, could interpret it for different audiences. Um, but then I think under all the restructuring, there was something of a disinvestment in that kind of resource, mm. um, but perhaps it's picking up again. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what I'm picking up is, you know, certainly a number of you think that this is something that is worthy to play with, um, recognizing the pragmatics of the real world. Um, there is a variability in terms of whether this is something within our organizations at the moment, we'd have the skills to, to cover this off or whether we need um, um, uh, um, um, additional training. I mean, what you have here is you've got NEQOS, which is um, committed to trying to support improvements of quality across the northeast of England and, uh, uh, well, I suppose northeast and North Cumbria, but I still see that. Well, I suppose that's northwest of England, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, I, my ge geography's gone. I've been out of the country for 12 years. I have no idea where I am. Um, um, yeah, so one of the comments, and, and, and uh, um, yeah, this is something I think particularly uh, you know, Jackie and Catherine are interested in, is you know, well, what are the kind of next steps? You've had two what are in effect introductory sessions. Um, and I think at one, you know, one level, um, yeah, hopefully they've been useful, but I'm, I would find it probably... Uh, interesting if people could go back into your organizations and trust and apply what we've been talking about tomorrow without any sort of further kind of activities. And so I think one of the things we're interested in knowing is sort of what are the, you know, what if, if any, um, additional sort of things would be helpful um, for you to start to think about how you might be able to use this um, in your organizations to test the waters within that. So we'd be kind of interested in any views on that. And do you want to say anything about that, Jackie? Or, or do you want yeah, sure. I don't. I don't want it uh, to, uh, just to sound like an answer because getting to the solution is something you've taught us not to do today. But just to, to perhaps break down one or two of the issues um, from an academic health science network perspective, and this this work is ultimately you know part, you know it's, it's a core and you know, strategically very important part of the, what the AHSN is doing. But today we've seen two of the areas that we're most interested in, the, the respiratory medicine and the end of life care, you know, played out in some detail under your expert direction, guys. And we're, you know, that's, that's really, really useful to have a framework to, you know, to, um, to play within and to, you know, and, and, and the immediate feedback has been very, you know, very, very helpful and how people are doing that. But it, it does raise, you know, there are two very clear issues there, and is, you know, where are these programs of work going to go within the AHSN, you know, underpinned by the evidence that NEQOS are providing in terms of the need, the, um, the, the benchmarking, the, the outcomes work and all that, which Jackie and I have very intense uh, sessions debating and, and working through, because we're still, we're still in the formative stages of that. However, COPD and end of life care are not going anywhere in our programs of work. So they're going to continue. And I suspect most of the people who work on that are in this room. And most people, you know, a lot of the people who work in that, in those two spheres, you know, and continue to do in the HSN are here. How do we support, you know, how do we collectively support people as they do that? Now, this 
today's event has been very different from the, one, from the first one. Hmm. I don't know whether that's because we, 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 people were working on programs that they, that, you know, that, that, you know, that weren't sort of uh, straw men type thing. But it, it has felt very different. And we're getting to the stage where people are actually thinking about how they would use stuff, but, they're, but, but nobody's, you know, this is, this is a fairly stringent academic framework we're talking about here. So taking that and applying it in a, you know, in a 40-minute meeting tomorrow, you know, when you're talking about what problem you're going to tackle, it's unlikely to happen. So, but the challenge to all of you is that you're the people who are going to have to make the change happen, whether it's end of life care or COPD. You know, we're going to have to do this at pace and at scale. That's almost certainly going to mean in primary care, predominantly. And you know, that, so that those those issues are all are all really live and. Um, uh, the facilitation has been great, but how do the champions come from within now? I think that's, that's a slightly longer term process, or what's clearly a longer term process. But uh, I thought that you just reflect that you know, back in sort of a fairly neutral way, I think. Um, I hope people would support this end of life and respiratory you know, remaining priorities. I think that's uh, the frail elderly stuff and the respiratory are definitely you know, critical needs. Um, I'm a bit worried actually there's only one trust that has got a sort of an identifiable champion in this. Um, so what, what do you mean? Well, the, the, when we have, you know, when, when we were asked, you know, which trusts could, um, could nominate, could identify someone with, to whom these frameworks would not be alien, would be part of their, their job to, to apply those sorts of methodologies within the change uh, patterns of the organization. Uh, is that is that the case? Because all right, I wasn't sure whether what the answer was one or many in that. We all, we all have it. You all have it. Okay. Okay. I think one thing I'd ask around that there would be, um, you know, what we're describing is a kind of a new set of techniques, new set of methods, and my guess is we, you know, all the trusts have got kind of you know strong quality groups with a commitment to these areas. But one of the questions would be within those quality groups, do people, are people aware of these models in a way that they could apply them so that they could actually help move it forward? Because we've been kind of almost at a high level saying, look, this is kind of, here's some things to do. Thank you. I, I guess in a similar way to... Oh, have you got a microphone? I, the, sorry. Oh, you need yeah. near your mouth. Sorry, in a similar way to the, the Academic Health Sciences Network providing that support, I think um, certainly for myself within the North of England Commissioning Support Unit, I feel that we've got a similar role in terms of supporting our CCGs um, and the, the pieces of work they're doing and the networks that they have to actually try and bring and help them implement some of these tools and techniques where they're useful. And I'd be really interested in having a conversation pro probably with the, the Academic Health Sciences Network as well about how we join up around doing that and that we don't all go off and kind of scattergun and try and try and do it in our own way, that actually we have some kind of, kind of systematic approach to that. So that would be really helpful. I mean, one of the things I'm kind of thinking about is... Um, I just want to uh, yeah, say sorry. that I'm not. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I've spoken to Joanne Dobson from Next on the phone. You're not Joanne. Uh, I'm not Joanne, but I work for Joanne. Okay, <laughs> and, and, and we've already acknowledged the need for um, the collaboration for Better Care it's Partnership to, to build on Next um, and, and the offer that you have. So, so that is already something that we are acting now. I just wanted to mm. emphasise that. But in a way, that would be very really nice. Understand what we're all saying, yeah. so it, it's very difficult to understand. So there are many of us going away with doing nets work, lean work, IGI work, the uh, aqua work, and but if we can all bring it all together, we'll be a lot better. Yeah. I suppose I've got a question: and where does the science of implementation meet the science of health economics? Because I think it was a really good point that was brought up earlier on after the excellent presentation on the um, uh, work on COPD was what happens 
you know, have you made cost savings? I mean, that's something that we're in trying to train housing associations to link effectively with health. We've just done some work with London School of Economics, which is a really a sort of a health housing association's guide to the health service. But one of the things that's come out of that is there are three things that you need to hit in uh, making change stick in the health service at the moment. One is around outputs, what, yeah, and the next is about outcomes, but also it's about cost effectiveness, um, and that's not the way we'd normally measure cost effectiveness. That's the way health economics, or health economists think of cost effectiveness. And it would be interesting to see, perhaps uh, the question that was raised earlier on is, you know, is it sustainable? A lot of this will depend on whether it can make visible cost savings. Um, so I guess maybe a suggestion for a third event is what do we do when implementation science meets health economics? Um, well, the, I mean, well, so one response would be, um, I mean, uh, implementation science should be trying to understand the costs and benefits of the interventions that we're using to try and change behaviour. Um, one of the issues is that healthcare systems tend to have a much smaller budget for the quality improvement issues than they do for their clinical budget issues. Uh, and so one of the issues is how do we get the biggest bang for the buck out of our small quality budget that will impact on the larger budget, that, and that's where you're going to kind of get your, your savings. Uh, and you need... Um, I mean, the problem is that from an efficiency point of view, you probably need very little change in clinical practice to make most of the things we're talking about um, cost effective. So uh, there was the EBOR trial of academic detailing that Nick Fremantle and Martin Eccles ran that showed that academic detailing led to a 4% improvement in prescribing, um, but it still was cost saving because uh, even though academic detailing is quite an expensive intervention, drugs cost so much that marginal changes in drugs would make a big difference. Some of the, but you know, some of the challenges are that healthcare systems are not very good at sort of thinking about the investment here will offset there. Or if you take Avril's example, the offset here, uh, the offset is going to be not in the sector where the costs are incurred. Yeah, you know, the costs are incurred in the hospital sector, and the costs are, uh, or the benefits are assumed uh, in the community sector. Now, someone said, well, if you've got a PCG at the table, that might, you know, that, that would be a good selling point for them. But it often is quite hard to, to sort that through. So I think implementation science is trying to sort of say, alongside how do we change behavior, you know, what does it cost? And then the idea is you might be able to model it. If we know that by doing X, you can get a 4% improvement in clinical processes and you're trying to improve stroke thrombolysis, you can model whether a 4% improvement in stroke thrombolysis is ultimately worthwhile. But if you say something like, and you'll save you know, you know, um, uh, 50 lives a year in the, uh, in the north of England, then it probably is going to be cost effective because of the costs of, that we ascribe to, to lives saved. So, so it, it's part of the puzzle. And the, I think the issue is that you're trying to do quality study, uh, quality work in a very restrained setting. Yeah, that's the kind of the reality of Avril's life, that she's not got lots of resources and a large team. She's you know, basically firefighting all the time to, at the margin, see what she can do. Um, but, but it is where the science is trying to go. Can I come back a bit? Because I think well, there's a kind of interesting issue about what's the role of, say, the Academic Health Science Network, NEQOS, and... Next. Next. Okay. Good. So, so I mean, I've, I've been out of the UK for, for 12 years, and um, the acronym soup is, is wonderful. I mean, it's great. That, so, yeah, so there's an issue about what should happen, if you like, at a, at a higher level, and there's also an issue about what should happen within trusts um, or within organisations. And I think there's an issue about, you know, what probably we need to think about both of those levels of activity. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I think if Justin and I were uh, working with, say, the Northumbria um, Trust on um, uh, um, um, ventilation, is we'd actually want to sort of go down and sort of talk about what's happening in the front line of your organization using some of these models. So go down and get data so that we can then sort of think about how to move it forward. Now, yeah, that would suggest that maybe we need to think about what's the skill set required at the level of the organization. But you could also, at the next level, say, well, you know, actually, it's conceivable that the kind of issues that individual trusts are facing across the north of England are not that dissimilar, and we could actually get an economy of scale. And so I think there's, a, there's an interesting challenge, because I, I do think if we just do it at a higher level, then there's going to be a lot of nuances lost and a lot of um, the real 
on the ground, why Gates is different from Northumbria will get completely lost. But trying to find that right balance. Well, well, I agree with that. What I think we'd like to do is well, Sorry, go on. Within a network of um, providers, yeah. um, GP providers, whether we try and work with the north of England, north, north of north, the north of Tyne network, respiratory yeah. network, and work out models to um, improve quality. But it has to be big enough populations to show it as it makes sense. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. But is, yeah, so one model would be um, someone gives Justin a lot of money. I haven't got any money. No, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But someone says, sorry? This is the NHS, remember? Hmm. <laughs> What's the budget of the NHS? Getting smaller Yeah, but you still have a lot of money. Still the biggest uh, employer in, the, in Europe, and your, your global budget is huge. Give Justin a million dollars, a million pounds a year. Um, and he could work across all these mm. different groups. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's one model. The other model is to say, you know, um, there may still be an academic support, but we need to build capacity in these individual groups. Because we've talked about end of life care and COPD today, mm -hmm. but in three years time, it will be something else. Mm -hmm. And there'll be local issues that your trust is facing that may not be the priorities that you still want to try and improve the quality of care on. Mm -hmm. So one, I mean, so there's an interesting issue about, I mean, I, I like working at a high level, working across populations of practices or, or trusts, but you know, I think we need to think about, you know, do we need to work at both of these levels? If, we, if we're gonna work at a higher level, then there is an issue for the Academic Health Science Network, NEQOS and NEC to think about how that might be done, but we need to avoid the idea it's easy to kick it up there because the hope that they'll have lots of money and do it, whereas you know, we can't do it. Um, but I suspect there's still something that um, you know, people in the frontline trust trying to do quality, mm -hmm. you know, this is an additional set of tools that might be useful. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we send people on training for lean and other things. We, you know, we, we have resources to try and actually train people in some of these activities. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a very good idea. Hmm? Sounds like a good idea. Okay. Um, so I guess I'd be interested in maybe uh, Jackie's view on this, I mean, one of the things, uh, after this session, yeah, we're gonna have a discussion about, well, should there be other activities? Yeah, it could be that, yeah, it's very nice, just and I have had two kind of very interesting days engaging with you, and then, yeah, and you've, yeah, we say this has been a sufficient flavoring of this, um, and then, you know, largely, yeah, it's just part of your general academic or, or uh, professional development, or are there things that we should be doing that would, if you like, go to that next level of expertise, um, allow people to sort of be much more engaged in trying to actively use some of these models in their quality improvement processes with some support. So kind of, yeah, I don't know if there's any final last thoughts or reflections um, about whether, you know, we should be doing, trying to do more of these activities or should we and basically be able to say, okay, we've got some sense about this and yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we can draw a line under there. Um, yeah. I mean, Jackie, do you want to say anything about where NEQOS is in terms of particularly this sort of line of work? Because I, I think we're kind of looking for some guidance from the people in the room. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, um, the background to the Academic Health Science Network in, Sorry. in a nutshell, um, is that the government uh, recognise that patients out there don't always get the benefits that society can offer. And those are benefits that have, have been generated through research and through innovation. And by enabling um, the fruits of research and the fruits of innovation to come to patients, then we will get better standards of patient care, we'll get better patients' outcomes. We will also get better wealth in the region because there'll be more jobs, um, more production of uh, new technology and new innovation, more collaboration with key industries like the pharmaceutical industry. And by creating wealth in this region in particular, we will also create health because much of the ill health in this region is lack of deprivation. So we need to understand the basis of the HSN and the basis in which the Collaborator for Better Care Partnership has been um, created. 
So the point of the Collaborating for Better Care Partnership is to reflect those goals and justifications for the Academic Health Science Network. So what we're trying to do as a collaborative is recognise that patients don't always get the care that they could do. Uh, it's not because the evidence isn't there or the innovation isn't there. It's purely a lack of collaboration and partnership working. Yes, there's a shortage of resources in terms of money to throw at quality improvement initiatives. But if we work as a collaborative and bring industry into the equation, if we bring academics, I don't, you know, typically Justin and Jeremy into the equation, then we can begin to build a culture of collaboration which builds on everybody's resources and can generate exponential benefits for patients. And the fact that Jerry's here today um, from a private industry, and um, we've got pharmaceutical industry here, all willing to bring resources to benefit the NHS and benefit patients. And that's really what we're, we're trying to achieve. We're not um, trying to sell anything particular in terms of philosophy. Okay, so um, there are various change methodologies and we're willing to embrace them all. And we, we you know, Lean is one of those, Nets is building on Lean. Um, but there are other approaches. The pharmaceutical um, industry has its approach. And the Collaboration for Better Care Partnership will be introducing you to other approaches. It's just that the benefit of implementation science is that it is a science and there is an evidence base for what we're doing. So it seemed appropriate to build on that. It's also a, a jewel in the crown of our local um, academic institutions. So we wanted to build on that too. So that's the justification for the implementation science. In terms of, of our approach for the Collaboration for Better Care Partnership, that was built on some research. So we actually did surveys of um, primary care and um, secondary care trusts to say, do you implement NICE guidance? Do you do it consistently? Do you have a, uh, an approach? Do you think it works? What would help you? And we've got lots of results from that. I can go into those detail if you've got time. But there was an enthusiasm to have a collaborative, a collaborative that would perhaps fill the gaps that have been left by the networks that have been undone. So specifically the respiratory network and the end of life care network, that was an opportunity. Um, and also um, the opportunity to bring metrics and measurement into the equation, that was recognized as a gap. The um, opportunity to link in with um, academia was recognised as a gap because NETS and Lean are built on Toyota and, and other um, sources of inspiration, shall we say. So, so we built a collaborative with three streams, um, strategic intentions that we would try and work collaboratively with industry, with academia and with the health service to improve patient care, building on implementation science and other change methodologies. We would also work um, to develop measures to show where priorities would be for change and to demonstrate where improvements have been made um, and to create and empower and enable the leadership and the organisational structures that would enable that to happen. What we haven't referred to so far is the fact that we've involved NICE in that and Stephen Sterica from um, NICE, our regional implementation consultant, has been a, a core part of that. And, and we're beginning to actually embrace what industry can offer. I'm now seeing the opportunities that innovation could be. Um, so I don't think implementation science is the only way forward, but I do think that what Jeremy said right at the beginning of this morning is evident that what people do to improve things for the patient is often based on who speaks loudest and what seems a good idea at the time. Um, and what we're trying to do here is open your minds up to other ways of working, other frameworks that are available and um, can provide a structure that are evidence-based and can show things that can actually work. So, so that's really where we're coming from and what we're trying to achieve. I hope that's clear to everybody. Yeah, so I think one of the issues is, you know, um, you're lucky. You know, compared to my country, um, is actually sort of investment in structures into this area. So, so I think one of the things. So, so I mean, I think one of the things you know we'd like you to reflect on is, you know, if this has value, what is going to be the best way of actually sort of skilling up both your trusts and the region 
Um, but I think you probably need to be at both of those levels because um, yeah, a lot of this is kind of quite local in terms of understanding the cultures of what's happening in your in your own settings and trusts. Um, so even when we're talking about COPD, it was clear about um, there are very different models across the, pro uh, the region compared from Gateshead uh, to Northumbria to Darlington that probably would be faced with the same problem, that there'd be kind of, you know, different contextualized solutions. So that suggests you know, a local level of activity. So what, what we'd be kind of interested in is both you know, potentially at the regional level but also at the trust level, what can we do to help you use these approaches um, as, as part of your toolkit, as part of the other things that you're doing? Um, so we're kind of interested in kind of reflections on that, okay? Um, this feels like, it's, been a bit harder work um, in the last sort of half an hour or so, but it's partly because it's probably not clear that there's one path forward. Um, but, you know, I think there is a willingness of NECOS to think about further sort of more implementation science type sessions. Um, but I think Jess and I both share the view that they shouldn't be, I mean, they, they need to be a bit more applied to what your, your practical issues and skill yourself up actually using your problems rather than, if you like, problems we're bringing in. So again, any reflections on the day would be useful. I mean, uh, um, I'll, I'll say yeah, some closing words, but hopefully this <coughs> session and the previous session have been helpful have identified kind of potentially new areas of knowledge which hopefully will help when you're thinking about your kind of quality uh, approaches in your sort of, uh, in your settings. That there's a willingness to think about what else can we do that would actually be of practical support to you. Um, yeah, but we'd like to try and make sure that we are prioritizing what would have value for you. Um, I think talking for myself, but probably also for Justin, I mean, one of the reasons we like doing this is that you're kind of trying to deal with this in the real world. Uh, and we get a huge amount from actually learning um, um, and hearing what you've been doing uh, and the kind of realities that you face. And it's, it's a way of, actually sort of seeing whether the things that we, are, we spend our lives working on have value for people who are trying to do this in, in the real world. So that's kind of, I think, why we engage, because it actually is very stimulating to us. So, I mean, from my perspective, it's been a really interesting day. Had a great time with the group. Learned a lot more about COPD and ventilation than uh, um, I thought I'd ever need to know. Um, uh, but that's how it goes, I guess. So I'm going to hand over to Justin, because... Um, we, um, um, yeah, we want to practice what we preach and uh, um, um, uh, ask you to um, uh, play with us. Right. So, um, hopefully, having gone through the process of practicing some of this, use, using some of these tools, you're at least a little bit motivated to take it forward. And the thing that we wouldn't want to happen is that you see this as a sort of one-off or two-off um, uh, educational session and you go away and say, that sounds great, but you know, on to the next one. Hopefully you'll be a bit more motivated than that, but we know that even being motivated is, is not enough. And so this is me trying to shoehorn in some behavioral science to change your behavior here. Um, so what I'd like you to do before you leave, i.e. now, is to think about um, one action that you could take over the next week that applies what we've covered today. It'll be different for, it'll most likely be different for everyone. It may be something very simple, such as speak to one of your colleagues about using this. It might be a little bit more involved. But I'd like you to think about, if you were to take what you've covered today, what we learned today, identify one thing that you want to use over the next week, or if the week isn't appropriate, maybe a month. Choose an action, first of all. And I want you to specifically write down when you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, and how you're going to do it. And I'm looking at you all and hoping that you're not just pretending that you're writing something down. Does anybody want to share their plan for the benefit of others? Anyone? Yes. I've agreed that I'm going to make contact with Stephen from NICE to look at how we can work jointly with the housing sector to use implementation science to look at how we might work to implement some of the NICE standards 
and have an integrated care pathway outside the clinical setting. Brilliant. Okay, so hopefully you've all written down what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, and how you will. But we also know, having covered barriers extensively today, that things come up and you may not necessarily follow through with that when, where, how plan that you've just formed. So what I want you to do is think about, based on you know, your everyday work experience, what might stop you from doing what you've just written down? And try to think of some way of getting around that that, you, that will ensure that you, you manage to do it. And try to think creatively. My aim is to um, take this um, an overview of the, today's session um, back to our Safe Care Council where we have representation from across the organisation, um, different groups of staff, not just clinical staff, um, and um, you know, just raise awareness of, around what's been happening. Um, but also I'd like to consider looking at how I might apply this particular model to one area of nice guidance that perhaps we are struggling with in the organisation and work with the service perhaps to um, facilitate that. Great. And can you think of any, anything that will stop you from doing that, that you might need a, a backup plan? Um, it's just time really and, and the, pri you know, the competing pressures and priorities. Um, but just got to do it. Great. Super. So it sounds dead simple, maybe overly simple, but there's actually quite a large evidence base around just doing this something a little bit more active at the end of sessions such as these that actually speak to one of Mark's points around moving from the type one or type two to type one thinking this means that you don't need to make those decisions and when you get back that you've actually thought it through, made a plan, and if that barrier comes up, hopefully you'll be able to, to get around it. But uh, that's, that's my attempt of in injecting some behavioral science into your life. Okay.